So um, we're going to transition now into our time of teaching, and we have um, Pastor Doug Schomburg here again with us today. He was here last week, and then this is his second week, and it's just, just those two weeks that we've our friends with, well, we'll be friends with you for a long time, but this is when you're in our community for these two weeks. So, and his wife, Wendy, is with us as well. So Doug is a retired pastor in the Presbyterian denomination. Um, he retired early from, yes, what I understand, you don't look that old. Um, <laughs> and now he is a consultant and coach um, in relational systems, working with individuals and, and companies and um, yeah, groups of people. And he's also working on his doctorate in practical theology at McMaster, uh, McMaster Divinity College. Um, and that's that connection at Mac was um, through Pastor Mark a couple months ago, and so that's how we met Doug, and now we are friends. And uh, yeah, I'm going to read um, his, not his scripture passage; it is the Lord's scripture passage. Um, but so we're going to turn to Philippians 4, starting at verse 2, and it will be on the screen behind you. And you can also turn in your pew Bibles or on your phone um, and follow along with me if you like. And we're reading from the ESV version. I entreat Eodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand, so do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but had no opportunity. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me, and yet it was kind of you to share my trouble." And you Philippians yourselves know that at the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving, except only you. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received payment in full and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent me, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. To God our Father, to our God and Father, be glory forever and ever. Amen. I'm not a handheld microphone preacher, so excuse me as I learn this new skill. I want to uh, say thank you, uh, first of all, to the families for allowing me, a guest preacher, to be with you on such an important and special day. Um, I want to thank Jamie for wrecking me with that video before coming up here. We have a 27-year-old daughter, a 25-year-old son, and that video rang very true. And uh, you almost had me losing my marbles watching it, so thank you for that. I also want to thank the Bethel congregation. As you were standing, making your promise to these families, I heard you because your promise rang through into my own family. Uh, Wendy and I, our daughter, came to Queens and worshiped with you here from 2012 to 2016. And those promises that you made to support families in their raising of children in the love of God um, just completely rang true for us. And so I identify with you uh, 
just rejoicing in the presence of Bethel and their promises because I have been a recipient of that goodness and of that promise myself. So thank you, Bethel, for that and for your goodness in uh, reaching and uh, offering a hand of support as we raise our children together. So again, very grateful. We had a great week with you last week. You've received us warmly and uh, we feel like we're among friends. So thank you for that. We had a good week in Eastern Ontario. You live clearly in God's country and uh, I'm a little browner than I was last week because I've had a really, really good week. So again, a real gift and pleasure to be with you today. So thank you for that. Let us pray for God's understanding as we prepare to reflect on his word. Lord God, your word, it brings life. Your word is light in the darkness. It is clarity in confusion. It is peace in chaos. Your word is hope to the hopeless, it is joy to the anxious, it is a challenge to the complacent, it is strength to the weary. Your word is water in the desert, food when we're hungry. Your word brings flesh and skin to dry bones. Lord our God, we want to live. So as we reflect on your scripture, which was read for us today, breathe your spirit into us and bring us to life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Peace and contentment are elusive qualities. From my perspective, I don't see them in many places or in many people. And I expect this might be true for you too. So it can be difficult to find those from whom we can learn, emulate, and imitate contentment and peace. Philippians 4 is my go-to passage for these. I have brought this passage to countless hospital rooms, funeral homes, counseling sessions, and truly to simple everyday situations. It's easy. It's easy enough to disturb the peace. I'm embarrassed to say that my own peace is easily disturbed. I'm still a work in progress growing in my own faith. There are the obvious things that disturb the peace. The neighbor's dog that needs to be brought in because it's been barking for a long time for its own entertainment rather than because of rabbits in the backyard, disturbing my peace. The party down the street that's gone on too long, always on a Saturday night when the preacher has to work the next day. The headline or the post on social media that seems purposely designed to get me riled. Here's a note for you. That's exactly the intent to which they are designed. Disturbing my peace. Some things are pretty minor, but nevertheless disturb my peace. The junk drawer in the kitchen disturbs my peace. When I open it to look for a pen, my chest tightens just a little bit. The Tupperware cupboard, really all I want is a lid. I already put the leftovers in the bottom of the container. Why are the lids always gone? Somewhere Tupperware lids are partying with single socks from the dryer. And so when something as relatively minor as a missing lid happens, I can be guilty of ranting, of disturbing everyone else's peace as well as my own. Living with me has its challenges. Wendy is a good woman. Disturbing the peace, some of it's obvious, some of it's relatively minor, but some of it is indeed significant. Strained relationships at work, grievances from the staff or the union, the pressure of too much work and not enough time, wondering if your job's still gonna be there in six months, cantankerous clients, demanding patrons, difficult colleagues, all disturbing the peace, keeping you awake at night, giving you the knot in your stomach, Poor health can disturb the peace, waiting for a diagnosis, not feeling well and not being able to get a diagnosis. Aging and experiencing your abilities and your independence shrink. An emergency trip to the hospital that leaves you and your family shaken. A diagnosis that changes your present and future. These disturb the peace. Relationships can disturb the peace. Marital conflict, getting along with your children, getting along with your parents, siblings, in-laws, getting along with your friends, getting along with your neighbors. It's easy, easy enough to disturb the peace. Getting along isn't always easy. The idea of loving your neighbor, the concept of keeping the peace, these are lovely. 
And in our head, it's something we believe everyone should do. The practice of doing them, the doing of them, that is the hard part. Now, we have various strategies for restoring the peace. And at some point, you may or may not have tried one or more of these. Try and ignore what disturbs you. Just push all the Tupperware back in and close the cupboard door quickly. Hope it doesn't fall open. Don't call the doctor. Don't go to the doctor. Don't tell the doctor what's really going on. Let the stuff at work just slide by. Don't, don't say anything. We say let sleeping dogs lie or, or don't stir the pot. And at a certain level, there's peace. But it's only a piece on the surface. The undercurrent is still there, speeding along underneath. Put a stone or a log into that water and you'll see rapids and you'll see turbulence. Some try and bring peace with a scorched earth approach. Some try and gain peace by destroying others. Run down everyone and everything that's in your way. March down the street, knock at the door, and lose it with the people who have that dog that barks. Have a blowout fight with your family member, never speak to them again. Accuse the doctors of incompetence. Write letters to the editor berating the hospital, threaten to sue. Some go for clandestine guerrilla warfare. Quietly take people down at a lunch conversation. Create doubt about their character, or their competence. Pull down other people's confidence. Sow doubt. We live in an anxious, reactive, easily upset world. People are generally not chill. And whether that sense of hype is something that's fueled by the media or reflected back to us in social media, whether it's a change in our culture or a subscription to a new value and belief that I have the right to never feel uncomfortable, whatever it is, anxiety, reactivity, upset, unsettledness, the lack of peace, it's prevalent. It's inside us, and it's all around us. But we crave it, peace. That place in our minds and our hearts that isn't racing, jumping, fretting, or pacing. A place in our minds and hearts that is still calm, tranquil. A place like the psalmist describes in Psalm 46. A fortress, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though the waters roar and foam, mountains quake with their surging. Nevertheless, it is a place that feels safe and secure. A place where wars cease and instruments of war are destroyed. A place where God breaks the bow and shatters the spear and burns the shields with fire. A place where the instruments that break peace are destroyed. A place where God says to us, be still and know that I am God. Here in today's scripture lesson, tucked away toward the end of Paul's letter to the church in the city of Philippi, a letter to Paul's beloved and arguably favorite church, there is a note to remind us that even in this near-perfect church, the peace could be disturbed. Euodia and Syntyche were two women in the Philippian church who had a disagreement a broken peace. We aren't told what it was, but it was upsetting enough, disturbed the peace enough that Paul knew about it, despite being provinces away from the epicenter. Word had gotten to him where he was. It was enough of a disturbance of the peace that Paul said, I plead with Euodia, I plead with Syntyche, to agree with each other in the Lord. And he says in a personal aside to his friends in the church, and I ask you to, to help these women, They've contended at my side in the cause of the gospel. Paul calls them his co-workers. These two women were on the same side. Unlike the Jewish Christians whom Paul was so angry with, these two women were both his friends, his co-workers, two people he knew and respected. A lot like situations we come across in everyday life, sometimes even in the life of the church. So what are Paul's words of advice for those for whom the peace has been broken? Paul's approach to restoring the peace, he says this. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. I don't know about you, but I typically heard this verse all on its own with no context around it. There's a song I learned at camp where the words were just this verse. 
Sometimes people quoted this verse at me when I was feeling down. I, I could never understand why I wasn't allowed to feel sad. And it was like this verse said, you must never have low times. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. But taken in context, knowing Paul was speaking to women who were in conflict, to a church that was conflicted, this verse takes on a new dimension. Instead of breaking the peace, worrying, fighting, Paul says, replace it with something else. Do this instead. Have you ever received the advice, try not to think about it? It's a near impossible task. Psychologists have done studies about our efforts to suppress thoughts. It's really, really difficult. A classic example would be for me to tell you, don't think about a pink elephant. And it immediately comes to mind, even though I told you not to think about it, there it is. Paul doesn't say, don't think about what has broken your peace. It would be right up there with the quality of advice of don't think about pink elephants. Instead, he says, rejoice in the Lord. And it's so important that he repeats it. I will say it again, rejoice. Peace does not begin by dwelling in or on what broke the peace. Peace starts with rejoicing in the Lord. Peace starts with Paul's reminder to let gentleness show through. Let that fruit of the Spirit show through. Let your gentleness be evident to all. Not stomping, not throwing up your hands in despair, not ranting, not complaining, not ruminating. Gentleness. The Lord is near. Our translation today said the Lord is at hand. Right here. I hear the Lord is near in two ways. One, God's got this. God is our fortress and our strength. The Lord is near, so be at peace. But I hear it in another way too, which is before you further destroy the peace, before you lose it on someone, before you hit send on your social media, before you let the doctor have a piece of your mind, remember, the Lord is near. The Lord is at hand. The Lord is over your shoulder reading what you wrote, sitting in the room listening to what you say, standing at your side watching what you do. So let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. So no worries, God's got this, but the Lord is near. So no ranting, because God is your witness. When your peace is disturbed, Focus your energy on rejoicing in God, on looking at God, looking at the goodness of our good, good Father. Now, one of the most famous verses in the Bible comes next. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. This verse gives you the steps to take to restore your peace. Do not be anxious about anything. Rather than be anxious, rather than worry, rather than fret, rather than rant, in everything, whatever it is, present your request to God. Prayer, petition, asking God, but presenting the request with thanksgiving. Two steps. Your petition, your request. Don't deny before God what you've got going on in your heart. Don't try and pretend it's not happening or that it doesn't exist. It takes a lot of hard work to hold a beach ball underwater. By prayer and petition, present your request to God. Let the beach ball up with God. Tell him what you've got going on. Tell him what you need. But that's only one part of it. Because if you only bring your petitions before God, you will not be less anxious. You will have the energy and anxiety of the advocate, the rippling energy of the person who needs to make something happen, who wants to get it their way, who's trying to get God to act on their terms in the way that they want. Paul says there's two parts to your request before God. The second, after petition, is to make it with thanksgiving. Make your request known to God. Be honest with God about what it is that's breaking your peace, but offer that prayer with thanksgiving. It's these two things together that encourage peace. 
They don't bring peace individually on their own. Pray only the request. Your relationship with God becomes you giving God a to-do list on your behalf. Prayers in your name rather than in Jesus' name. Pray only thanksgivings, and you deny what's actually going on in your life. Neither on their own bring peace. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And then hear this. Hear what Paul says next. And then, then the peace of God, which is beyond all understanding, will guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. In every situation, big or small, don't be anxious. In every situation, present your request with prayer and petition. Cancer? Present your request. I don't want cancer. I don't want them to have cancer. Lord, bring your healing. Make them well. Please let that treatment work. But with thanksgiving for health care, that they found it, for extra time because of treatment, for the kindnesses shown to us when people heard, for the love that has been expressed to us because people know. Thanksgiving that your love is stronger than death, God, that your promises reach beyond this life into the next. And because of that, we will be a witness of grace and hope in the midst of trial. Present your request with thanksgiving. And the peace of God, which is beyond all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. It will keep the peace. Paul finishes this section with reinforcements to keep the peace. Peacekeepers. Ways to push back the pink elephant of anxiety, fretting and fighting. It's a lesson about looking in the right places when your peace is broken. He says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. They're peacekeepers. Look for them. Think about them. It's Fred Rogers from the famous Mr. Rogers Neighborhood television show who's quoted as saying, when I was a boy and I would see scary things in the news, my mother would say to me, look for the helpers. You will always find people who are helping. Think about these things. And finally, Paul says, whatever you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, do these things, and the God of peace will be with you. It's easy enough to disturb the peace. It ranges from the silly and mundane to the life-changing, terrifying. It ranges from the small wars and in friendships and family like Euodia and Syntyches to worldwide battles. But when your peace is being broken, remember the Lord is near. Rejoice in the Lord. Present your requests in prayer and petition, but do them with thanksgiving. And whatever is excellent and praiseworthy, think about those things and do those things. And Paul says, the peace of God will guard your heart and your mind in Christ. The peace of God will be with you. Now, like peace, contentment can be tricky. We live in a world that fights against our contentment. But this passage continues to show its power as Paul describes learning the secret of being content. James White wrote something that far too easily captures what can be my own experience. Uses words that can far too easily be my words. He shares, you know, I, I sat down and, and looked through some magazines this past week. And I discovered that if I want to feel right, I need to get a Nordic track. I don't have a Nordic track, just a, a membership down at the gym. And so suddenly I realized that I, I didn't feel as healthy as I thought I did. And then I read that if I wanted to be stylish, I would need to buy a Toyota Camry. Our family van was in the shop, and so I'd been driving our old Mercury Sable, and that felt bad enough. Real men drive SUVs or bright red sports cars. I've got four kids, so I don't have the luxury of driving what real men drive. So I found out that I couldn't be stylish with the cars that I owned. And then I saw that if I really wanted to, uh, if I wanted to really feel the summer season, I had to dress for the summer season. And the only place for that was at Dillard's. 
and I knew I wouldn't have a chance to go to Dillard's that week, and suddenly the beautiful weather just didn't seem that beautiful. I just wasn't dressed for it. Didn't get any better. I learned that I needed to be opening my mail with a knife from Oneida. I only had a $2 letter opener from the office depot, and now even my mail was disappointing. On top of that, I discovered that I couldn't have a good meal if I wasn't in Texas, at least not a meal that would satisfy me so much for the lean cuisines. And I read that if I wanted to be a man, at least a manlier man than my neighbor, I had to drive a yardman mower with a Briggs and Stratton engine. I liked my house until I saw the ad for a new development and, you know, without a granite countertop in the kitchen, my house just seemed cheap. I thought my family and I were close until I realized we didn't have season passes to the amusement park. I even thought I loved my wife, but since I hadn't bought her the diamond necklace from the jewelry store, I was informed that my love was less than ideal. He says, by the time I finished with those magazines, I wasn't just depressed, I needed counseling. The immediate impression we are left with when we see something attractive in a magazine or when we scroll or when we're holding a new product in the store, the immediate impression we're left with when we see someone else's family and they seem genuinely happy and when we visit someone else's house and they just got an upgrade, the immediate impression we're left with when we ride in someone's newer car or looking at their vacation pictures on social media, the immediate impression we're left with as we listen to someone describe their new job or new medication that has them feeling great, it's this, well, if I just had that too, I'd be content or at least feel placated for a little while. And so we ask ourselves the question, how do I get that? When? Can I get that? Where can I get that? And what we don't realize is as soon as we've asked those questions, we've jumped onto a treadmill. We run to get to the next thing. We run to get to the next achievement. We run to make it all right. We run thinking that we're running toward contentment. But it's a treadmill. The end of a treadmill isn't a destination. The goal of a treadmill isn't a new location. The purpose of a treadmill is to keep you running in place. A few years ago, a book came out that caused quite a stir. It was called The Secret by Rhonda Byrne. It's one of those Oprah phenomena books. She mentioned it on her show. Everyone went and bought it. It was a book that promised to give you the secret of getting everything you want. And the essence of The Secret was what was called the law of attraction. The author claims that everything in the universe, capital U, universe, vibrates on a particular frequency. And when you think in harmony with the frequency of something, you, you attract it to yourself. If you think about wealth, you will receive wealth. If instead you think about your debt, you'll receive more debt. You attract what you think about. Your thoughts determine your destiny. According to the product description, this is the secret to everything, the secret to unlimited joy, health, money, relationships, love, youth, everything you ever wanted. Byrne promises with ironclad certainty. This is a quote. There isn't a single thing that you cannot do with this knowledge. The secret can give you whatever you want. And by it, you will come to know how you can have, be, or do anything you want. This seems suspicious to me. I hope it does to you. I went to the astronaut ball at Sudbury's Science North on a family vacation when my kids were little. I had my arms and legs splayed out and fastened so that I looked like da Vinci's Vitruvian man. And then they spun me around to simulate weightlessness. Well, despite having been attracting the idea of being an astronaut and trying to attract astronaut to myself from the universe, I quite quickly learned I am never going to be an astronaut. I did not attract astronaut potential to myself in that astronaut ball. I repelled it away. I projectile repelled it away. <laughs> and it was no secret to anyone that astronaut would be crossed off Doug's list. Doing anything I want is not in the cards. Being anything I want is not in my future. Having anything I want, it's not going to happen. I'm a man. 
I'm not going to give birth to a baby. I've been known to have a cow, but I will not give birth to a baby. I'm six feet tall. I'm in my 50s. The NBA is off the list. I'm clergy. So unless I declare that the end of the world is coming in October and invite people to send me their love offering, I will not be one of the world's uber wealthy. But despite this kind of reality check, despite seeing quite plainly that being, doing, having anything isn't realistic, somehow it's lodged in us. Part of our society are twisted into pretzels trying to live this belief. We jump onto the treadmill believing we can run to contentment run to get to the next thing, that we can run to get to the next achievement. We run, and we run, and we run. But here's a secret for you. When you're on a treadmill, you don't finish by getting to a destination. You finish by getting off. Paul wrote this in his letter. I've learned the secret the secret of contentment. And I find this part of Paul's letter kind of amusing. It's the end of the letter, and he's ending it kind of awkwardly. It's not often that you see Paul squirm with awkwardness. This is a guy who is typically tell it like it is sort of individual, pulls no punches, calls it like he sees it. Paul could be the person at the office or in the plant or at the lunch table who speaks first, speaks definitively, is confident of being right, and truthfully often is. Paul's the kind of guy who writes things like, you foolish Galatians, what's bewitched you? I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the spirit by observing the law or by trusting in what you heard? Right, thought so. Paul usually writes in a straight up voice, in your anger, do not sin. Don't let unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. Live a life of love. But here, his writing has the body posture of the person shyly looking at his feet struggling to make eye contact, not quite knowing how to put it all into words. In, in counseling, there's a trade term uh, for a behavior that happens quite often. We call it the door handle. It's the item that the person who came to see you really wanted to talk about, but they spend an hour on something else. But then as they grab the door handle on the way out, with only a minute left in your 50-minute hour, they bring up the topic. It has that now or never flavor to it. So here we are at the end of the letter, and Paul's grabbed the door handle. Uh, now, concerning the gift, Paul's been given a gift from the Philippian church. They'd been generous to him, took up an offering, sent it to their missionary Paul, who was in prison in Rome. And Paul doesn't know quite what to say or how to say it. I, I have great joy. At last, you've expressed your concern for me, but I, I know you were concerned before. You, you just didn't have the opportunity. And I'm not saying it's because I'm in need. I'm good. I've been good. It's okay. I've learned to be content in every circumstance. I've had plenty. I've had hardly anything. In all circumstances, I've learned the secret of being content. Whether I'm hungry or full, whether I have plenty or nothing, I can do all things through the one who strengthens me. Which is sort of a really long way around, oh, you really shouldn't have. But then he backs up. But nevertheless, you did well to share with me. And you want to whisper, Paul, breathe, chill, just, just say thank you. But he keeps circling. Well, you know, no other church shared with me the way you did. You were sending me gifts even back when I was in Thessalonica. But I'm not looking for another gift. That's not what I'm saying. I, I just, I want you to get the credit. I've received everything. I have plenty. I got what you sent with Epaphroditus. It's great, fragrant offering, acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will supply your every need according to his glorious riches. And again, you want to whisper, well, maybe not whisper this time. Say to him a little more firmly, Paul, just say thank you. Stop the train. But I think what we're seeing is Paul pulling the plug on the treadmill. And I think what we're seeing is Paul refusing to run. And these comments of his, while a little awkward, they don't have any desperation in them. This is not the sound of feet pounding the treadmill saying, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Some more, please, some more, please, some more, please, some more, please. I don't know what I would have done if you hadn't sent the gift. They're not breathless racing thoughts. None of the other churches have given. And if you hadn't, then where would I be? But it's a somewhat awkward statement of calm. How do I tell you that while I'm pleased by your generosity, 
And while I want you to receive credit and that you did well to share with me, that despite all of that, you haven't rescued me from any sort of panic. I haven't been on a treadmill. I've been okay. I am okay. I will be okay. I'm able to do all things through God who gives me strength. It's the secret of my contentment. Again, context is everything when you're reading scripture. This verse may be arguably the most misused verse in the Bible. If it's not the top one, it's certainly in the top 10. Philippians 4.13 ends up on just too many posts in social media with pictures of sunsets to seemingly promise you everything, doing the same thing that Oprah's secret book did. But this time it's whitewashed as something Christian. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Without the context, it becomes just another, I'm going to be an astronaut verse. Just another magazine to flip through telling me that I should have whatever I want. I should get to be whatever I want, or I should get to do whatever I want. But this time, God should be providing it and strengthening me for it. What the verses around 413 let you see is that the secret of being content is actually stepping off the treadmill onto the solid foundation that is Jesus Christ. I can do all things is a reference to the ability to step off the treadmill onto the knowledge that God will lead you if you walk with him. I can do all things is learning to trust that where God leads, God will provide. It's learning to trust that I can do all that God has for me to do through Christ who strengthens me. The secret of contentment is realizing that God who gave you life, who gives you life, who will give you life, will also give you strength for the life he gave you, gives you, and wants to give you. He will not necessarily give you the life you want to grab hold of. You will be given the strength to do what God intends for you to do. It made Paul a little awkward trying to say thank you, but while also teaching the Philippians to trust in God at the same time. I'm glad for what you sent, but it's God who gives the gift. So I'm grateful to you, Philippians, and really we need to look at God and to God through whom we can do all these things. It's all gift. You can't run after contentment. Contentment can't be chased down. You have to step off the treadmill and look at where God puts you, what God has given you for today, and you rest into that, knowing that God will give you what you need in order to serve him again tomorrow. Don't forget, Paul had just finished saying, don't be anxious about anything. Tell God what you need. The peace of God, a peace that surpasses understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ. The Lord is near. The God of peace will be with you. The secret, Paul says, to holding plenty or to holding nothing is to find the strength of Jesus Christ, the Savior. Everything comes from God will return to God, who is all there ever was. And those who believe it can have peace and contentment. Douglas Oldenburg tells the story of a young man who learned and applied the secret that Paul speaks of. Oldenburg says, these thoughts were captured in the personal diary of a young man where he shared his thoughts late one night in a hospital room, sitting beside the bed of his young wife who was critically ill, worrying, waiting, and wondering. Oldenburg says, I'm sure that all of us would be tempted to choose bitterness or resentment or despair or reactivity in that painful situation, tempted to run on the treadmill of anxiety and fear. But listen to what the young man wrote sitting there beside her bed in that dimly lit room. Listen to the choice he made. She may die before morning, but I've been with her for four years. Four years. There's no way I could feel cheated if I did not have her for another day. I never deserved her for a single moment. God knows that. And I may be the one who dies before morning. What I must do now is accept the justice of death and the injustice of life. 
I've lived a good life, longer than many, better than most. My friend Tony died when he was 20. I've lived 32 years. I can't ask for another day. What did I do deserve birth? It's purely gift. And I'm in me. And that's a miracle. I have no right to a single moment. Some are given a single hour. I've had 32 years. Few can choose when they will die. I choose to accept death now. And as of this moment, I give up my perceived right to life, and I give up my right to her life too. But wait. It's morning. I've been given another day. Another day to live and read, and smell, and walk in glory. I'm alive for another day, and she's alive. It's a gift. Another gift. Paul has given us the coaching we need to find peace and contentment. He says, I've learned the secret of being content, whatever the circumstance. I'm able to do all things through the one who strengthens me. The Lord is near. Rejoice in the Lord. Don't be anxious, but in every situation, present your requests to God with thanksgiving. Put your faith into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Be content. Be at peace. The Lord is near. Amen. As the worship team come and get themselves into place, I invite you to pray with me. Lord God, you are near. Teach us the secret, the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether working or waiting for work, whether in good health or poor health, whatever our circumstance, teach us to trust in your power to rest in your peace. God, it'll probably mean letting go of our grasp on some things that we just continually try and control and manipulate. Teach us the secret, how to trust you, how to look to you, how to rely on you. Teach us to take it to you in prayer. Teach us to give thanks. Help us to listen. Our God, you've told us not to be anxious about anything. And so there's some stuff we've just got to put into your hands. We've got loved ones who are ill and need healing. There are those we care about who are in transitions that are really challenging. They need your guidance. There are those who need truth and justice to come forward so that healing can happen. We know of those who need work to get food back on the table. Our God, we pray for them and that they would know your contentment and your peace. God, remind us every day to bring our requests to you. Remind us every day to thank you. Remind us that you are near. And so may we be people who are peaceful, people who are content, people who reveal your faithfulness and goodness and calm because of our trust in you. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.